Welcome back everyone. In the previous video I talked about the Darlington transistor configuration. So today we're going to look at the Zeklai or Zeklay transistor configuration. I don't know exactly how that's pronounced. It's a foreign name and you know anything can go with that so I'll just run with Zeklay. This is also known as the complementary feedback pair or complementary Darlington configuration. So we'll investigate some interesting characteristics of the circuit and then at the end I'll talk about its use in audio power amplifier stages. This and of course the Darlington circuit. Which one's better? And there's a lot of debate there. George Zeklay is the inventor of the circuit. He's a Hungarian immigrant to the United States. Holds a whole bunch of patents in electronics and things like that. He did a lot of work with early television, including work on uh, camera tubes. Okay, let's take a look at this transistor configuration. It does kind of look confusing at first, but we'll work through that and, and hopefully make it make some sense. One interesting characteristic is, notice how I have this labeled here. Of course I have the base here and the collector is here even though this is a PNP transistor and on its collector I have emitter. What's happening here is this transistor even though the output is a PNP or Q2 is a PNP it behaves as a NPN. So I have it labeled as an NPN in quotes here. So how this works is if you put a voltage on the base of Q1 and turn this on, this junction is already forward biased on Q2. So current is going to pass through here. And now that this is conducting, it's going to allow the current to pass through. And since current is now going through the emitter to base junction of Q2, it can now conduct. That's the basics of how this works. So let's take a look at the gain. And we'll make up a situation similar to the Darlington circuit we did before. So we'll say that this transistor has a gain of 100. That's Q1. And Q2 will have a gain of 50. We will put 100 microamps into the base. So we'll just say 1 or 0.1 milliamp of current. And we'll draw the arrow here. So with a beta of 100 multiplied by the base current of 0.1, that gives us a current of 10 milliamps flowing here. And of course flowing here as well. The current in the emitter circuit would be 10.1. The reason for that, you have the 10 milliamps flowing here and the base current also flowing there. Now you have 10 milliamps flowing through the base of the PNP transistor. That means we have another current here of 500 milliamps, 10 times the gain of 50 here is 500 milliamps. But we have those two currents in this leg, so we have to add them together. So the total current would be 510 milliamps. The gain is the ratio of this, the current we're controlling, to the current we're inputting to the base here. So it's 510 divided by 0.1. So the beta is equal to 5,100. This is the current gain formula for the CFP pair. So we have total beta is equal to Q1 times Q2 plus Q1. So we have 100 times 50, which is 5,000, plus 100, or 5,100. So that works out. So let's take a look at some interesting characteristics of the complementary feedback pair. If you remember with the Darlington circuit, we had two base emitter junctions. 
So we had to put 1.3 volts on the base to get any current to flow through it to turn this circuit on. So you have 0.65 here and 0.65 here in this junction for a total of 1.3. But as you see here, there's only one base emitter junction, so we only need 0.65 volts to turn this circuit on. So that is a positive with this configuration. Less voltage on the base to turn this circuit on. Just like with the Darlington configuration, Q2 cannot saturate. And the reason is similar. If Q2 is in saturation, the collector voltage can actually be lower than the base voltage. Now let me say one thing. We are dealing with a PNP transistor here. When you talk about that, you're usually talking about negative voltages. But the way this circuit's set up, I don't want to confuse anybody. So kind of bear with me here. Pretend for a moment that Q1 is not in this circuit. Well, the voltage from the emitter to the base would be 0.65, but the voltage from the emitter to collector in saturation would be much less. It would be like 200 millivolts, give or take. And in that situation, current would tend to want to flow this way, and with this transistor here, that cannot happen. So this cannot saturate. There has to be a current flow this way through the circuit. So the collector cannot be lower than the base voltage. And just like the Darlington circuit, because this doesn't go into saturation, there's going to be that larger voltage drop from the collector to emitter. So you want to be careful when drawing heavy currents. You will dissipate some energy. Okay, I have a complementary feedback pair circuit set up. This here is Q2. This is Q1. In what I'm calling the collector, actually the emitter of Q2, I guess it's a, like a quasi-collector, I have this incandescent light bulb. In the base here I have a 10K resistor and also an LED in series. So if I push the button, you see it lights up nicely. That's about 400 microamps controlling 80 milliamps. So if I put my probes across Q2's collector and emitter junction, you see that it is not saturated. It has that 0.65 or so voltage drop. And that could increase under heavier loads. So just like the Darlington circuit, Q2 cannot saturate. Just like with the Darlington configuration, this circuit will benefit with a speed-up resistor. And just like in the Darlington circuit, let me get my drawing here, we connect a resistor from the base to the emitter of Q2. Same situation here, we have a resistor from the emitter to the base, and that helps to speed up the switching of the circuit. So let's say the circuit is on and you turn it off. This transistor goes off and doesn't conduct anymore. You'll have some residual charge here and that will keep this transistor turned on. So getting rid of that charge by bypassing the base and emitter will drain that off and help speed up the circuit. And again, you see a lot of uh, parallels to the Darlington circuit here. Another similarity is that this transistor will not turn on until the voltage drop across this resistor reaches 0.65. So we have to have enough current going through here to get that voltage drop high enough before this transistor turns on. In other words, this transistor will be doing all of the work at low currents. Let's check that out. Okay, I've replaced the base resistor. It was 10K before, now it's 470. Current is switched on. You can see the LED is lighting up very slightly. It's only a few microamps flowing right now, probably like 10. So if I meter across 
this resistor, the speed up resistor, which goes from base to emitter. And let me do it this way so I don't block the view. There is 247, about 250 millivolts across that resistor. So if we do the ohms law, that's 247 millivolts divided by 120 ohms, which is the value. I use the same value that I did in the Darlington circuit. In this case, we have 2 milliamps flowing. But is this transistor, is Q2 turned on? Let's see here. I'll go from base to emitter. And look at that. I have full battery voltage. So this is not conducting. It's not turned on at all. You can measure the current if you want, but, you know, that junction only has 247 millivolts, so Q2 is definitely not conducting. Well, because we are shunting current away, which would normally flow through this junction, this does reduce the gain of the circuit. But again, just like the Darlington circuit, if you have a gain of 5100, for example, and it's dropped down to 2,000 or even 1,000. That's still a heck of a lot more than 50, isn't it? So the benefit of having the speed up resistor, you know, really increasing the performance of this, but at the cost of gain, you still have quite a bit of gain to work with. Not a big deal to me. So now we're going to move on to audio amplifier output stages. And we'll look at this stage here. This is called a quasi-complementary stage. And it was the first widespread use of the CFP configuration. And also, it used the Darlington configuration. Now this is just a simplified drawing here. I'm not showing all the driving components and everything. Just mainly the output stage itself. What? Uh-oh, we got a kitty crying. The reason for doing this is because back in the early days, we didn't have very good or inexpensive PNP type silicon transistors. We did have PNP germanium, but they wanted to get away with germanium and higher power amplifiers because of the thermal issues with germanium transistors, among other things. So we did have decent NPN transistors, so we needed to use NPNs with both of the outputs. So we have the Darlington stage up here in the upper part and the lower part we use the complementary feedback pair. And again because the circuit behaves as the polarity of its driver this NPN acted as a PNP so I put it in quotes. So that solved the issue. However early designs this was not really that complementary to the upper stage and it caused distortions and other issues. But the engineering kicked in and they added resistors and diodes to the circuit and they made it work pretty well. And there were some pretty decent amps back in the day using the quasi-complementary design. So now things are starting to get interesting. Not too much longer we were able to develop good silicon power PNP type transistors and that allowed us to make fully complementary output stages and in this case we're using a emitter follower configuration in both the upper and lower parts of this amplifier and also because we had power PNP silicon now we could make a fully complementary CFP output stage I've read a couple books about audio amplifier design, read stuff online and things like that. What's very interesting is different engineers and amplifier designers have different opinions of these circuits. Some favor this design, others favor this design. Let's see why the complementary feedback pair is favored. Well, in this configuration, remember we had a little bit less gain, but this circuit gives a lot more feedback to itself, and it makes it quite a bit more linear. And linearity means less distortion. So some designers favor this circuit a lot more. For example, 
Rod Elliott on ESP, he says, why would we even use this Darlington configuration when this is so much more linear? The circuit also has better thermal stability. Normally you have to mount a sensing device on the heat sink and it's connected back to a servo circuit which helps keep this stable as the temperature rises. With much more thermal stability you don't have to do that. You still want to monitor your bias to keep it level but you can put the sensing device on the driver transistor and that will help keep your bias setting stable. But the chance of thermal runaway is much less in the circuit. Okay, so why do other people favor the Darlington configuration? Although both configurations can go unstable and oscillate, the Darlington tends to be a little bit more stable than this. However, designers who favor the CFP says, well, you can get this circuit stable unconditionally. So, you know, that's another reason I to continue using this. Other designers say I wouldn't use this in a commercial design because of its instability. My thoughts on that is if you can build the circuit and it's unconditionally stable when you run stability tests and things on it, sure, use it. Another positive for the Darlington emitter follower configuration is paralleling output transistors in high power amplifiers. If you're making amplifiers over 100 watts, then it starts to be desirable to use parallel output devices. Now, if you're making a 500 watt amp, you might want to have four or five output transistors in parallel. And it works better using the Darlington configuration to parallel. It doesn't work that well with the CFP. Another thing I've read about at low output powers with the Darlington emitter follower is actually has less distortion than the complementary feedback pair. You know, this has better linearity at higher power. This does better at low power. And you probably do a lot of your serious music listening at a lower power unless you like to, you know, crank it up all the time. So what is my opinion of this? If you're not going to use an amplifier that requires paralleled output devices, I would look at both circuits and choose the one that works best for you. You know, if you can get the distortion down to very low values using either circuit, well, make a choice of which one you want to use. Uh-oh, we have a kitty in the way. If you can make the circuits unconditionally stable, you know, from oscillation or thermal issues, then, you know, both would work for me. It would be nice at some future point to investigate both of these circuits and see how they perform. You know, I might have to have some better equipment to be able to measure distortion levels down to very low values. But again, in either case, very, very nice amplifiers have been made using either the Darlington emitter follower or the CFP type output stages. That's it on the Z-Clay or complementary feedback pair. Hopefully it was interesting for you. I thought it was kind of fun putting this video together. Thanks for watching.